Hey everybody, Tony D. It's about 4 a.m. I can't, I'm too wired to go to sleep. I've been drinking iced tea all day. Um, but I did watch a uh, really good South Korean movie again. South Koreans, you guys are kicking it out of the park. Uh, Space Sweepers, it's currently playing on Netflix. Space Sweepers is a movie about a group of, a uh, ragtag group of misfits who live on a spaceship and they collect space debris uh, for money and they're continually in debt. Uh, and uh, the movie was about them, of course, discovering this uh, secret cargo which contained a, a, a young child and that who's every everybody's after because she's going to save the world. And um, uh, it was very interesting to watch the journey of the characters in particular was very interesting because, um, you know, they uh, uh, start the movie very angry <laughs> and bitter people. But by the end of the movie, their encounter with the little girl really changes them in a lot of different ways. Um, so uh, that, you know, that that would be my non-spoiler review. It's currently playing on Netflix. I don't know if, for how much longer. Somebody recommended it to me months ago, and I, I, I just got around to seeing it. Uh, but I felt, you know, it's one of those movies you watch, and although there were some very sad moments, um, you know, I felt really good after watching the movie because it has pretty positive message at, at, at the end, I think. But let's get into the nitty gritty. If you're going to watch it, stop the video now, go watch it. Now we're going to get into some spoilers and some uh, uh, technical stuff for the screenwriters. All right. So I'm going to assume you watch the movie and we're going to break it down. First act. The first act is uh, sort of the establishment of the characters. Um, I can't say their Korean names. Uh... There's the pilot, the captain, I'll call him the pilot, the captain, and Park, and uh, the robot, right? So they establish their characters, and they're kind of these grubby people who are constantly in debt. And uh, uh, then, they, you know, they're especially established the pilot. Can't, I can't think of how to say his name. I heard it a million times, and I still can't say it. Um and he, of course, is obsessed with finding his daughter, who unfortunately passed away. I thought she might actually, you know, be alive at the end of the movie somehow, but it didn't go that way. I think in an American movie, she would have been alive. So it was refreshing in that, you know, it kind of would have been a cheat to make her alive at the end, I think. It would have sort of undermined his whole character's deal, his whole character's vulnerability. And man, they really played it for the maximum drama too, I think. But anyhow, that first act, of course, they establish the characters. And then the characters find Dorothy, uh, the little girl with magical powers. <laughs> and at first, of course, they're hot to sell her. And uh, uh, because they think she's an android with a bomb inside her. So... Uh, uh, then the second act, uh, they're trying to sell her and they're dealing with what they think is a terrorist cell. And then it all turns out to be, you know, the main bad guy, the head of UTS. I forget his name. Uh, he had a very boring name. He was a really good actor, though. He's very sinister, I thought. The main uh, bad guy. Was it Robert something or James something? I forget the guy's character's name. He's really good. He was creepy. Uh, and no knock to who he reminds me of, but I actually have an associate who, who looked a lot like him. And I immediately saw him. I'm like, oh, that looks like so-and-so. Um, no knock against him, but, uh, you know, he, he was very sinister in a very interesting way. And he also, you know, a lot of times in uh, uh, movies, they'll have a character like that, right? He's super old, but he's somehow staying young. And then they'll go way too into how he's keeping himself young and then there'll be this exposition. But they didn't really do that in Space Sweepers, you notice. They just kind of assume, like, you know, they show him getting the treatments, right? And and sort of veining out. 
and then he gets the treatment and kind of goes back to normal, I guess, uh, or whatever he's doing. I'm not quite sure. Either that, he just gets mad. I wasn't quite clear on it, but I kind of like not being totally clear on that because it was just assumed, since it's the future, he's got some gadget that keeps him alive, right? So I like that. And I also like the whole plot with him made a lot of sense. Like he he's gonna repopulate Mars, although somehow using the girl, that was a little much. I think, I don't think he really would have needed the girl, but I think he still would have had reasons to kill her because of course he didn't want Earth to survive because that way he could remake everything at Mars and kill everybody who he considered beneath him. And they really hammered that point home for his character. He was very, very sinister that way of looking down on people and thinking they were scum while actually being scum himself. I really enjoyed that, that the layers of villainy that guy had. Really good. So we get a, a, a good establishment of, uh, uh, of that in the second act. And then the third act, which was very... I'll say luxurious, right? It's all about them defending the girl, getting her back, making the big sacrifice at the end, which, you know, the girl saves them, which I was, I was kind of like, at first I was like, I don't know, I, oh my God, they're all going to kill themselves, right? And then, boom, she saves them all. And that was, that was kind of nice, right? I was like, wow, that's great. Um, you know, she had that ability. I mean, they well established that, but you know, that was that was stretching her abilities very far, as well as you know the final sort of resolution with the pilot meeting his uh, uh, dead daughter, which was so sad. Man, South Koreans, you guys really know how to do your drama. You are you are no slouches in that department. Wow, I was cheering up in that scene because I was just like. Uh, on the one hand, I was so happy he got that resolution. On the other hand, I was so sad, too. Guys really worked it. Um, so there was just so much great emotion in the movie. The actors were great. You know, they start out the movie so petty and, and mad at each other. And then by the end of the movie, because of the presence of the little girl, you know, they really just can't bring themselves to sell her or hurt her or do anything. And they all just sort of get almost taken over by her, uh, which was so great. And they didn't spend, I like how they observed things and didn't need to, to spell it out too, right? It was a really show, don't tell. You know, when the girl resurrects the tomato plant, although I think I was expecting at least one character to say, how did the tomato plant get, get much, you know, way healthier? But, um, I kind of like that, and I kind of like the whole scene where they sell the tomatoes. That was great fun. There's so many fun scenes in it, um, which uh, uh, was great, and it was really kind of a satisfying ending, and particularly with the robot, uh, because I thought, wow, here's a great way that some filmmakers did a character who's who I guess you would call call the character trans, right? It's kind of... Kind of a, even though it's robot, right? Really, the character's trans. And uh, it was a great way to do that without beating you over the head with the whole trans agenda or whatever. So I really like that character. And to me, this is a, this is the, like a positive kind of movie thing, right? You were able to put in a character who's basically trans who was really positive, who was a hero, and, um, you know, not not give us a lecture or anything like that. You know, even in the scene where uh, the robot tells the little girl that he really wants, like, a sexy girl, you know, robot body or, or, or skin suit or whatever they called it. You know, it, it, you know, you watch that scene when you're watching that and thinking to yourself, Oh, uh, yeah, that's kind of, like, funny, but seems so, like, out of his range. You know what I mean? Like, because he's so bulky and big, like, how would they even manage to do that? And then, like, I totally forgot. Of course, I, for I forget things when I'm watching a movie. I'm so engrossed sometimes. And this movie was very engrossing. So then, you know, they go through so much after that scene. And then 
that I think, oh my God, they're all dead. And, and, uh, and then they all come back to life. See, if it was a different kind of movie, it was an American movie and like the main characters were like, I don't know, the Guardians of the Galaxy or something, or even just the actors from that movie, I would have been like, oh, they're not dead. She's going to bring them back to life. But with this movie, because I don't really know the actors, um, and because it's not an American movie, I could could have seen them all die at the end. And then, you know, they get their due in that everybody thinks of them as great people, even though they they kind of didn't, you know, they were they didn't see themselves as great people. But I did. I was really happy that they lived. But I could have seen an ending where they all died, too. Um, so I, I think there was a lot of emotion. That, you know, you see the journeys of all the characters. They all become super positive by the end of the movie, right? They all become her guardians in a sense. Um, I, w I guess my only criticism of the movie is it's a little long. Um, that seems to be a pattern in South Korean movies. I thought it was weird, the bad guy at the end let them live, but they did justify it because he had this whole thing of like, you know, proving to everybody how much better he was as a person. But even so, like, he's like, well, kill them, you know, the moment the thing crashes or whatever. And that just didn't seem a good plan to leave them alive, right? I think, I think if that to me was the major thing, something should have happened. Like he either should have tried to kill them there or disabled their ship. It didn't seem to make any sense to even give them the hope that they were all going to live. You know, it should have been like they go to start the ship up and it's completely disabled and then they do something to undisable it or whatever, you know. Um, so that was sort of the major thing for me in the movie. But I was willing to overlook it because I had, I had so much fun. I mean... The effects are cool. I like the whole thing with the harpoon, harpooning stuff. Uh, that made the space battles uh, more unique. I like the whole uh, outside the ship fighting kind of thing, right? With the girl and, you know, the captain at the end on the balcony, like, shooting the gun. That was a lot of fun. Um, you know, and that was... That made sense in that context. You know, it's it's not Star Wars. They don't have a bunch of guns on the outside of the ship. Uh, like, she kind of had to do that. And then, of course, the robot jumping from ship to ship doing stuff. Um, that was fun. I mean, there's so many fun scenes in the movie. And uh, the great drama. I mean, everything was good. And um, the w version I watched on Netflix was dubbed. But it was also... I had the subtitles on because I like to leave them on. Because I'm a bit of a dialogue guy, you know, I love dialogue. And the interesting thing was the dialogue in the subtitles was different than the dialogue that they dubbed. Uh, the dialogue that they dubbed was more American. So like there's a scene where the captain says, um, that's cringe. And that was the dubbed line. And the written line was something they didn't use the word cringe. They used like embarrassing or some, some other word. So I started to notice that as I was glancing at the subtitles and I'm like, what's the deal here? I'm not sure why they did that, but it was kind of interesting. It was sort of like watching, you know, two versions of the movie at once, you know, different dialogue choices. And I, I suspect that the subtitles were the exact translation and then the dubbing was, you know, they brought in a screenwriter to tweak it and sound more American. Uh, you know, they probably had a straight up translation and then he went through it and kind of tweaked it. But I got to say, you know, I, I barely noticed. And there were a lot of different languages too, which was interesting too, because it was very international because there was a French character and a Russian character. And uh, I, I assume some of that was in English. I thought the sound was done very well too, in terms of the dubbing. It's very like, you know, sometimes you watch a dubbed movie and you could really tell it's dubbed in that, not just the lips, but the sound is off, right? Every time the movie's dubbed, it's like, no, this movie was like almost seamless 
uh, sound quality. So in terms of its quality and craftsman craftsmanship, I, I, I would say Space Sweepers is, a, is a, you know, really up there. Uh, other than that minor plot thing, which, you know, could have been corrected. Uh, it almost kills me a little bit that they didn't fix that and just put a little something in that would have just delayed them or that, you know, would have made more sense rather than like, oh, we'll just camp out here and we'll shoot them when they start to leave or whatever. Seemed, seemed odd, but whatever. Um, great, great to watch. Uh, so check out Space Sweepers on Netflix whenever you get a chance.